Prologue. Harry fucking Moss. When Private Harry Moss ran from the demons at midnight on Good Friday of 1917, he regretted every cigarette he'd ever smoked in his young life. His mother warned him they would steal his wind, but Harry did not believe it for a single minute. In primary school, he was the fastest boy in his class, and as a winger on the local youth rugby side, he used that speed to score a record number of tries. It still stood, as far as Harry knew. Harry had latched on to the tobacco habit even then, just for fun with the lads, and never noticed any ill effects. But truth be told, he did not start pursuing smoking in earnest until he was working on the railway. Shoveling coal was an absolute shit job. The one worst vocation he could think of was digging the foul crap out of the ground to begin with. So secure and desolate in the knowledge that shoveling coal into the coal cars at London Bridge Station was likely to be his life's work. He threw in his lot as a full-time, professional-grade smoker with the older men in the yard. After all, it did not seem that running fast was going to be an important aspect of his existence again. That is, until the Great War broke out. Unfortunately, by that point, he was so horribly addicted that if he did not smoke before the rouse was sounded in the morning, calling the men to formation, he would have a full migraine coming on before they were released from drill and ceremony for breakfast. His internal clock learned to awaken him ten minutes before the rouse was blown, so he had time to roll up and suck down his first cigarette before the day officially began. Harry had dropped his rifle somewhere between Bert Thomas and the Abbey. Perhaps thrown was a better description than dropped. Both his arms were pumping now for speed, and he saw the light from his flashlight dancing up and down on the ground in front of him. His boots were pounding the earth, and his heart was racing. He heard the rat-tat-tat of its timpani in his ears. But it was his charcoal lungs that were killing him. They ached from the strain, and he felt as if he was drowning, unable to pull in enough oxygen, not just to keep his pace up, but to keep him living and breathing. As he turned the corner behind the abbey, a stream of his mates with their rifles at port arms double time passed in the opposite direction. Bringing up the rear were two of his best pals, Tommy Winters and Kevin Bergen. Oi, what's the story, Harry? Kevin hollered as they jogged past. Harry pulled up short, hands on knees, sucking wind. He pointed to the field where another rifle crack sounded. The two words Harry found tumbled out. <gasps> Something's <laughs> coming. <gasps> Kevin and Tommy had known Harry from childhood. Top boy at school. Not one to fuck about. Brilliant on the rugby pitch. Not some chicken-livered bastard. This had all been Harry's big idea to begin with. And he never shirked a day. They all joined up together in 16, when the government's big enlistment sales pitch revolved around the Pals Brigades. Lord Kitzner himself guaranteed that if you joined up with your Pals, you could serve together in the same unit until a war was won. Easy peasy. It was a damn effective, horrible idea. Harry and Tommy and Kevin and John, and other Tommy, had all joined up together, and it was a total lark at the start. The girls went stark crazy with the fresh scrub, clean-shaven local boys, who for the most part were wearing their first ever new clothes. Even Tommy, with the beginnings of his beer belly, looked the part of the dashing young infantryman. The uniforms, food, and cigarettes were all 100% free. And they gave you money. Not much, to be sure, but a shilling a day worked out to buy plenty of beer. And yes, the instructors screamed and hooted and raged until they were red in the face. And there was a lot to remember about how to stand, how to salute, how to march in proper order for what seemed days on end. However, there were rifles to shoot, straw dummies to stab with bayonets, wrestling to be done with the other lads, and rugby matches between the companies, 
that Harry and Tommy and Kevin and John and other Tommy absolutely dominated. Three months later, they were in the trenches. And they were in for it. On 1st of July, 1916, Harry and Tommy and Kevin and John and other Tommy went over the top as the Battle of the Somme commenced. By noon, the British Army had suffered 60,000 casualties in their PALS brigades. Because the PALS were fighting in the same units and the bloodbath was so deep, it stood to reason that entire towns lost all their men in one morning's work. Deeply regret to inform you, telegrams went to nearly every house in those quaint little villages when all of their fathers and sons and brothers and cousins and nephews ended up not waking at the rouse and reporting for roll call on July 2nd. Harry's company was luckier than those, but their list of the fallen included John, who got shot in the sternum as he came out the trench. He died in Kevin's arms with a sucking chest wound. It was like he were drowning underwater, but he weren't. He was right there on dry land. Maybe it were like a fish feels on the docks, Kevin later said, somberly, after all his tears had been spent. Other Tommy got hit by a burst of shrapnel. He was so disfigured that they all agreed maybe it was not even him, as they stared at the remains later on. Harry could not get over the fact that an ear was missing. The grotesque visual stuck with him. Plenty of other things were gone too, which made him unrecognisable as their other Tommy. Yet here was that full head of curly brown hair on a yellowy white skull. It looked a great deal like other Tommy's coiffure. But that absent right ear had been sheared clean off, as if some skilled butcher had applied a very sharp meat cleaver to it. And the ear's absence made the corpse look utterly alien. After all, other Tommy definitely had two ears. So how could this be him? They did their best to promote the idea amongst themselves that maybe their other Tommy had been captured by the Jerrys and was now sitting out the war in Berlin. Perhaps this was some other poor, bloated, dead, earless bastard. Inside, they all knew better. After the Somme, Kevin was ready to go home. It had been Harry Moss who sat him down when he found him packing a bag and convinced him that if he ran or tried the shirt or declared himself a conchy, a roundly detested conscientious objector, he would get field treatment number one. Tied up to a wagon wheel in range of the German guns was no way to get yourself killed. Kevin spat back. Drowning on dry land and getting smithereened by shrapnel bits is no bloody fucking way to get yourself killed either. Harry finally talked him down and told him that if he played it smart, he would have some control over whether he lived or died. Do the bare fucking minimum, right? Whenever possible, do fucking nil. Always keep your head down. Don't ever be first out the trench when we hop the bags and never, never volunteer for anything that could be dangerous. Harry told him. Calmed, Kevin realised Harry was right. There was no running away from the grand machine that was the British Army. He recognised with glaring clarity that his only choice was to stay and soldier on by doing as little soldiering as humanly possible. So when Harry came tearing around the corner of the abbey, running in the opposite direction of the rifle fire, Kevin and Tommy took heed. <laughs> Something's <laughs> coming... Harry got one good breath of air in, and then the image of the monsters coming across that field hit him in the heart again, and he ran. Harry did not wait to see if Kevin and Tommy were following. He heard their boots hitting the ground behind him as he led them through the camp and into the meadow, heading fast toward the refuge of the thick woods beyond it. The forest was not twenty yards away when things started to go tits up. Harry's foot caught on something in the meadow, and it sent him sprawling. It was astonishing how quickly the ground came up to meet him. His flashlight bounced away, its beam strobing and tumbling until it rolled to a stop. Harry tasted blood in his mouth from where his teeth had sunken into his lower lip. He rolled over, ignoring the pain in his ribs 
He told himself that it was not any worse than a hard open field tackle on a pitch, and he began to shove himself up off the turf. Kevin and Tommy were twenty meters away when he went down, hustling after him but nowhere as fleet of foot. The flashlight landed pointing straight back toward them, so at first they could not see it, but Harry could. The thing that had tackled Harry Moss was an odd pair of hands reaching out of the furrowed ground. As Harry watched, those hands and the arms connected to them pressed up from the earth, revealing the torso of a British infantryman covered in dirt. He got his elbows out, then used them to start levering himself out of the sod. When Kevin and Tommy saw him, they came to a dead stop. Tommy cried, What the hell is going on, Harry? The dirty infantryman turned at the sound. It moved with a speed that was hard for the mind to comprehend, hitting Tommy with brutal ferocity, striking with its fists and elbows and knees like some kind of animal. It stunned him with a headbutt to the bridge of his nose. The popping cartilage sounded like a stick being snapped in two. As Tommy fell to the ground hollering, it went for his neck with its teeth. Kevin grabbed a hold of it by the back of its shirt, putting all his weight into trying to pull it off of Tommy. But the beast would not budge an inch. Tommy began to scream. Out of the darkness, something cracked Kevin in the mouth and he lost hold of the shirt tail. He heard his head strike the ground as he flapped back to the turf. He was stunned for a brief second, stars and pain in his vision. But it was not the first time he'd been cold-cocked in his life. Plenty of bar brawls had gone that way, and knowing that Tommy was in real danger spurred him up off the ground, looking for whoever had done him on the blind side. Three other dirt-covered infantrymen were now with them in the field. Kevin saw movement all around, where the moonlight was cutting through the darkness brightly enough to cast shadows. He had a funny thought. All the dead men he and Tommy had planted that afternoon had ripened and now seemed to be harvesting themselves. Kevin kept his fists up, was on the balls of his feet like a Marcus of Queensbury featherweight fighter, backing up in a ring as his opponents took his measure. He was shaking now, and he felt tears welling up in his eyes. In his periphery, he saw that Tommy had stopped moving and that the thing on top of him, satiate, was leaning back. It stood. As the dead men continued to claw their way out of the earth around him, and as the nearest ones with their matted hair and bright eyes shining out of dirty faces began to close on him, a plaintive voice came out of Kevin's throat, echoing Tommy's last words. What the hell is going on, Harry? But Harry Moss was gone. As he entered the woods, Harry heard Kevin cry out and then a distant, No, 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 no! that erupted into a high-pitched scream. For a gossamer sliver of time, Harry wanted to stop and turn. A voice in his head demanded it. Demanded honour. Demanded courage. Demanded self-sacrifice. But sheer terror had the upper hand, and no amount of willpower could overwhelm it. He plunged ahead because he could not go back. He made his bed when he ran from the fight in view of Sergeant Thomas. To return to the fray would mean death from any side he encountered. To fly with every ounce of his being was to escape, to live. So as our ancient predecessors ran from Vesuvius, its embers falling all around, igniting the forests of oak and chestnut, its piles of ash coming to bury, burn and suffocate them, their pumping legs the one distant hope for survival. Harry Moss ran. Brambles tore at him, tree limbs smacked him in the teeth. Out of nowhere, he ran head and shoulder first into the trunk of a tree. It stunned him and broke his collarbone cleanly. He shrieked in pain as he fell to the ground. In the blackened forest, all he saw was stars dancing in front of his eyes. He pressed up to all fours and tried to stand, but the concussion had taken his balance. As he straightened his spine, he took two dizzily random half-steps to the left, tripped over tree roots, and landed painfully on top of them. When he sat up, she was there, waiting. Her great grey head was perhaps twice as big as Harry's. Her yellow eyes caught the only light in the woods and reflected it back into Harry's own. Her canines bared, and for the briefest millisecond, Harry read the act as a smile. Then she snapped forward, and locked those smiling teeth under his chin. In a final defense of his courage, Harry did not go meekly. 
They punched and kicked and gouged and tried to twist away despite the pain of her bite. But she was immune. She held his neck in her mouth tightly and squeezed until he finally stopped thrashing. When she felt his blood stop pulsing, she let him drop in a bag of bones and delicious muck. But she did not feed. She sat back on her haunches and watched, temporarily slaking her need by licking his blood from her fur. She did not wait long. Harry Moss bolted up as if a charge of electricity had been shot through him. His mind raced and a torrent of memories flowed through Harry's brain that never did and never would belong to Harry Moss. They recalled the sound of howling from the dark, while a tribe, huddled by the fire, sharpened wooden spears at the ready. They saw the clash of a phalanx, and a slow-motion crushing death on the Grecian plains, caught between the bronze and hide shields of Ionians and Miletians, who pressed against each other in the thousands, turning to pulp any man caught in their human vice grip. He heard the Roman trumpet sound, the pounding of the master horator on his drum, felt the smooth braided coil of the leather lash in his hands as the longship bucked in the waves and the slaves put their whip-scarred backs into rowing. He felt the crash as the ship took the ramming broadside, the chaos as the chain slaves went under, the terror he felt as his bronze armor dragged him down, down, down into the azure Adriatic waters. A creaking gallows in Westphalia that failed to break his neck and swung him back and forth for long, desperate minutes to the delight of the crowd. The arrows from the English longbowmen piercing his steel placket and breastplate at Crecy, as if they'd been made of crepe papier. The guillotine's whoosh, the joy of the unwashed masses, and the powdered wig that his decapitated head watched tumble away in the breeze. Scalp and left to die on the American plains raped and gutted in the Khyber Pass, bayoneted at Shiloh, a Zulu spear in his belly at his Andalwana. All these memories of well-earned horror and more flowed through him. When they reached conclusion, he rose up. The she-wolf watched it all. Then she turned, disappearing into the woods, looking for more men to prey upon. But a knight was still young.